want to introduce myself. Um, so I'm trying to also log in through my phone. I'll, I'll try that in a minute. Um, and then, um, yeah, and then I'm done to do like a, just a, a kind of a quick overview. Um, I know, um, see, just kind of see where folks are at too. But um, yeah, if we want to get started, we can just uh, do intros and um, yeah, maybe we can just go around and if folks are cool um, with saying or typing, if you prefer to type, uh, our names, uh, gender pronoun, and um, yeah, maybe what brought us to this webinar. Uh, usually we don't get to always do that, you know, we, when we have more folks, we don't have the time to do that. But um, yeah, something I was thinking since we are a smaller group. So um, yeah, maybe we can just popcorn to each other. Um, so I'm Nadia, hello, uh, she, her. And um, again, with Stop LAPD Spying and what brings me here is um, this is a fight. Um, yeah, I'm just, I feel it's absolutely necessary. We all gotta be fighting the various wars against youth, right? Um, so yeah, I'll... Uh, I'll pass it uh, on to you, Sydney. Thanks, Nadia. Um, so similar to some other folks in this space, I used to be a um, high school teacher in the South Bronx. Um, and the ways that my students were classified kind of led me to leave teaching and do some like non-documented kind of teaching in libraries. And then I ended up being an activist researcher. So I am a part of this fight both to pay like respect and homage to my teaching groups and also to like kind of collaborate each other through this fight. And I'll pass it on to Hamid. Hey, greetings everybody. Hope everybody's doing well. My name is Hamid, I go by he, him. And uh, well, just uh, the youth are, I was a youth a long, long time ago, once upon a time, <laughs> and know that how youth are always targeted and constantly harassed and how intimidated and threatened and constantly a target of state violence in many different ways. So this is a very quick fight. I really appreciate everybody who's in the fight against the war on youth. Uh, pass it on to Matthews. Thanks, Ahmed. Hey, folks. My name is Matthews. I use he/him pronouns. Uh, community organizer at Stop LAPD Spying. Um, and yeah, just really invested in and excited about um, cultivating this kind of culture of resistance among our youth, especially as the police kind of like solidify their presence uh, within our schools and other youth spaces. So thrilled to be here with y'all. And I will pass it to Valerie. Hi, um, was, was there a check-in question? Yeah, also very excited to see you here, Valerie. Um, yeah, we're just saying our names, pronouns, and kind of what brought us into the space. All right, uh, my name is uh, Valerie Vargas. Uh, I, uh, my nephew was killed by LASD in East Los Angeles in 2018. And um, what I'm, I'm curious as to, um, well, I'm interested in these meetings also, because right now uh, we're having a, a problem with LASD targeting um, one of our 14-year-olds our and a 17-year-old. So I wanted to do more on this, see what, we are going to figure out how to navigate that. But I appreciate uh, sharing space with you all. It's good to be here. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Valerie. Valerie's a ferocious freedom fighter here in LA. And I will popcorn it on their behalf to uh, Natasha. Dope. And Natasha dropped in the chat that uh, they're with PYMLA. Thank you, Natasha. And 
uh, you're welcome to well maybe you can't see who all is in there um so i can um i'll popcorn over to jocelyn on your behalf if that's okay hi everyone um so my name is Jocelyn. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm here in this space today because I attended the event in Echo Park, um, and I learned a lot. Um, and also, specifically, I'm tuning in for this meeting because I'm an LAUSD graduate, and I um, definitely want to teach in LAUSD within the future. I'm currently reading, We Want to Do More Than Survive, Abolitionist Teaching and the Pursuit of Educational Freedom. And I thought joining today would be really, really appropriate for the work that I want to do in the long run. Thanks so much, Jocelyn. And if you want to popcorn it, I think uh, Vanessa hasn't gone yet and Angela just chimed in. So Angela, so good to see you in the space. We're just saying our names, pronouns, and uh, what kind of brought us into this space. But I think Jocelyn was about to popcorn it to whomever's left. And I don't think Akhil has gone either. Okay, um, I'll pass it on to Vanessa then. Hey everyone, Vanessa Ramos, she, her pronouns in Spanish. Um, uh, you say ella. Um, I am based out of Los Angeles. Um, I. I'm a you know LA drug war survivor um, and formerly incarcerated, and I'm a mom. So I you know what brings me to in this in this space is really just you know being a human rights, civil rights, disability rights um, advocate. Um, and you know this is just it's important work to me. Um, and our children are being targeted, and it's just very um, awful. Um, so I just want to um, just bring that into the space. And then I will popcorn it. Um, has Chela gone? No, I just got came in here. Hey, everyone. What's the prompt? Hi, Chela. Oh, go ahead. Oh, go, go ahead. Uh, well, go ahead. <laughs> this is Matia speaking. We're just saying our names, pronouns, and uh, what brought us into the space, and then popcorning over. Uh, and I can say who's left uh, as soon as you're done. Okay, hey everyone. Uh, my name is Chella. I go by she and they. I'm a part of the coordinating team. And yeah, uh, that's me. And go ahead and popcorn it to ever. Okay, I'll popcorn it on Chella's behalf to Angela. And Angela, you're muted, family, if you're, I can't tell, oh, you might be busy. All right. Good to see you, Angela. Angela, you're muted, by the way. I don't know if you're trying to unmute. Oh, you know, okay, all right. No worries. <laughs> well, let's pass it to EP then. You said to who? I said to EP, which I think is you. Oh, okay, that's me, all right. Uh, what's the prompt? Uh, the prompt is your, names, pro your name, pronoun, and um, what brought you into the space? And then you could popcorn it to, uh, I think I kills the only person left. Okay, well, uh, Eugene is uh, my name. Um, any pronoun works for me. Um, and what brought me here is what uh, normally brings me here, which is uh, learning shit about uh, the police and policing and, um, you know, organizing uh, accordingly. And uh, I'm going to popcorn it to the last person left. Uh, yeah, I think that's me. Uh, hi, everybody. My name is Akil. I use he, him pronouns. I'm with Stop LAPD Spying. And yeah, what brought me to this space, uh, what brought me here originally was um, trying to do organizing around the connections between uh, LAPD and Israeli police and military. And then when I started getting involved, I found um, this fight, which was being led by Nadia, along with um, PYM, Palestinian Youth Movement, and uh, 
I uh, I really resonated with the goals of this fight, specifically around youth organizing and youth liberation, and you know these programs that target youth as national security threats and extremists, and trying to end those. So, and I'm also uh, outside of this, I'm a teacher, but not currently teaching. And I will pass it back to Matthias. I think to, to yeah, and I'll pass it in turn to Nadia. I think was that leading us. Sorry. Yeah, no worries, no worries. Um, it's all good. We're sharing the space, facilitation, speaking, it's all good. Um, yeah, so I'm really glad we got to do that. Um, you know, I know, I know most webinars we, you know, we kind of just jump in. Um, and so yeah, I think having a, a smaller, more intimate group, we're able to do that, right? Um, just kind of go around and and just you know, hearing what what folks you know are going through or have gone through, um, I think is going to really be a good conversation today. What we're really trying to do today is, um, you know, share just like the current landscape, right? What is um, what are some current programs that we're fighting against, uh, right? What are, of course, what what is some of the history they're rooted in, and um, so I'll just share a little bit of background and. Um, and then, yeah, I think then I'll pass it to Matios. And I think also what will be great um, is for, cause you know, it really sounds like folks um, through their personal experiences uh, and or the work that you're doing, um, I mean, they can definitely uh, contribute a lot to this conversation about what is, you know, youth, what is the current state of youth surveillance, right? Where is it at? Uh, and then from there, we're gonna go into talking about uh, a, an art day we're gonna be doing uh, this Saturday. So we have, uh, this is something we've, um, you know, we've incorporated into workshops and everything, art and making of popular education materials, right, is, is definitely a core part of the fight. Um, but once kind of now post COVID, we wanted to get, just kind of increase more of that physical meetup. So we're doing these uh, on the third Saturday of each month, these youth art days. Uh, so really a space for youth to do art and uh, and then, of course, you know, learn about like surveillance and building power against it and just and and but really just creating that space to right to to um, to make art together. And so uh, we'll once we kind of talk about the current landscape, then we'll go into uh, discussing that as well. Um, and uh, yeah, just kind of what the plan is and what folks think about it. And hopefully y'all can spread the word as well. Um, so that will be this Saturday at 10 a.m. at uh, Vista Hermosa Park uh, in downtown LA, but we'll be talking about that uh, more. Um, so just to kind of start then, um, just to give a super, super quick background on what are the programs we're fighting against. These are these programs that are really fall into the umbrella of uh, targeting youth as uh, potential violent extremists, as terrorists, and really seeing how um, that label and that form of criminalization um, has been around. And of course, criminalizing youth, particularly uh, Black youth, Muslim youth, Brown youth, Indigenous youth, trans youth, um, is nothing new. And, um, you know, the last few decades, we've seen the gang narrative be extremely present in this criminalization. Um, and then really coming together now more explicitly with um, you know, uh, using violent extremism and terrorism as a means to criminalize youth. Um, and so these, these fall under the umbrella of a, a national program called Countering Violent Extremism or CVE, which is a program created by the Department of Homeland Security um, that essentially names behaviors as uh, indicators that a person is becoming quote radicalized or on the pathway to becoming a terrorist or violent extremist. And so underneath this umbrella um, is our different programs that have surfaced. So one being uh, the FBI program uh, called PVE, Preventing Violent Extremism, which um, specifically focuses on K through 12, so youth in schools, and really making guidelines that say, these things are indicators that a young person is on the pathway to becoming a violent extremist or a terrorist. So the behaviors they've listed are things that being too much into your culture, expressing anger, expressing frustration, uh, being in poverty, being a migrant, um, 
uh, you know, questioning authority, right? So, you know, very core elements of, of being an, an adolescent, being a young person are now these indicators, right? Um, and so a more recent kind of program, and that was from uh, 2016, but something, and, and these programs are constantly sort of evolving their name, but really the function is staying the same. Uh, what we're seeing now is these programs are falling under this umbrella called TVTP, which is Targeted Violence and Terrorism Prevention. And Akhil is putting uh, those uh, acronyms in the chat for y'all, because I know it's a lot. Uh, thank you for that. And so TVTP, right, is um, LA just recently passed a grant for it, right? LA was also one of the, the pilot cities for when CVE was implemented uh, back in 2011. Um, so now under this TVTP umbrella, uh, which is national as well, um, the LA specific program that falls under this um, is called PATH, which stands for Providing Alternatives to Hinder Extremism. Now that is an LA specific program because that now in includes LAPD in the equation more explicitly. Um, now, the one thing with these programs, right, CVE, PATH, TVTP, they do claim to be moving away from what, what sort of the explicit policing, really moving towards the community policing model in the sense of, okay, well, we don't have to send the cop, but you all can basically be snitching on each other, right? So whether it's your teacher, your counselor, your faith leader, um, you know, any, you know, any number of people you might encounter and work with, these are now, this is what these programs are encouraging. So that makes them especially more dangerous because, you know, for the reformist folks, for the folks who believe that reform uh, will help us, which obviously stop LAPD spying, we know that that does not help us and in fact harms us more, um, you know, for them, it's like, oh, these programs don't seem as harmful, but they're extremely harmful, right? Um, and so PATH essentially creates a team of a few hundred people, uh, including teachers and counselors and faith leaders, to essentially then report back, right, to LAPD and then report back to the Department of Homeland Security um, on various uh, behaviors, various things, right? Um, so yes, it's definitely, um, it's, it's newer and sort of it's, it's the way it's being uh, rolled out. Uh, but it's been kind of in the making now for, for some years, um, but we're really seeing this rollout happen a lot more now. And um, the last thing I'll mention before I pause for any questions is uh, there's a recent app called the uh, LASAR app, uh, L-A-S-A-R. And um, so that's basically an app uh, through the LAUSD, so created by LAUSD, uh, where anybody can anonymously report on each other, right? Um, so, I mean, yeah, there's so many way reasons this is problematic, right? Um, and so essentially anyone can, and, and so LAUSD has created two different versions of this app. They have the app specific for like LAUSD staff and faculty to report. Uh, and then they have this anonymous one, which anyone can, right? Students, anyone who downloads the app. Um, and so, you know, so obviously this is then, and with these trainings, right? So I, I, I teach at LAUSD too. And so when we get some of these trainings, right? And we're told different behaviors to look out for, obviously, you know, a lot of teachers, a lot of counselors are going to gladly participate in this, right? Of course, there's also a lot of teachers and counselors who are saying, fuck that too, right? Um, but, but we know it's uh, kind of all of the above. Uh, so anyways, I'll just pause there and just see if anybody has uh, any questions about any of the pro uh, any of the programs I listed um, before I pass it on to my test. Does anyone have any questions about anything? Uh, Vanessa, I see your hand. Go for it. Hi, yes. Well, first of all, thank you so much for all that you're doing. You know, uh, my kid, as some of you know, is starting Fairfax High, like the Arts Magnet. So I'd love for her to be a part of the third Saturdays of the month. My information's in the chat. She's an art, you know, she is an artist. So please know that like we can help contribute in any way, supply. So please count us in. And then also with the laser app, it literally um, makes me 
people want to cry because I can't even imagine what the children are being put through. Um, I professionally serve with Disability Rights California. We're California's protection and advocacy agency. Every state within our republic is federally and legally mandated to have a PNA. The reason why we exist is because we know that people, disabled people, which is most of us, right, um, are often um, targeted. Um, the laser app is extremely problematic. And, you know, as someone who, you know, I live with autism, I live with other disabilities, you know, my behaviors throughout school were mischaracterized. And because uh, non white or poor whites aren't appropriately met with healthcare services, we're often, we find ourselves um, in carceral settings. I, you know, uh, face being navigated incarceration, including solitary confinement. So for me, I know that DRC has worked on bills to move away from this. So last year we worked on AB 2598, which it goes into effect in January. So my interest is, you know, who can I connect with on here that we can have follow-up meetings because my hopes are to bring in, you know, some of the DRC legal staff that works on school-related items because this is problematic for more ways than one. One, disabled children oftentimes are mischaracterized and they get, like, I could start to show, I could behave in a way that makes people think like, oh my God, something's wrong and nothing's wrong. I just, and nothing's wrong. Like, this is how I am. Like, what is wrong? You know, so if I was in school during this time, you know, it could really, I would, could be reported. And then lastly, um, you know, there's a huge concern. Um, mental health is considered a disability. And there's a huge concern that, like, if I'm a student and I, and I report someone, I don't know that I'm going to be able to continue on my day and feel completely safe and secure. So I think it's pinning children against one another. I, after our last week's meeting, shared the app with my 14-year-old daughter just to gain her input. Hey, Esther, check this out. What do you think of this? And she's like, mom, this is like crazy, right? So it's not just me as an activist, right? This is my kid. And I asked her what some of her concerns are. So I'd like to consider us getting a group of children together, right? To think through what comes up for them, right? Like what are psychological psychologically, how can this damage somebody? You know, I know that children in the past that have reported other children have died by suicide. So like, let's not repeat those behaviors. Um, and, you know, who's funding this app? And I'll pause there. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you for sharing um, your story. And thank you for sharing that, Vanessa. Um, yeah, I, I definitely think this this will be and these programs have been and will continue to to target uh, disabled youth as well. Um, you know, and 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 yeah, and and in terms of like you know working together, I think definitely looking forward to that and and working with Esther and meeting them as well. And um, we've showed some youth um, this app, and and definitely they've really all just shared a lot of concerns with it. So I think it'll be great for us to just see how we can like move with that and build. Uh, build with that. So um, yeah, we'll definitely be reaching out. And, and just for any folks, we do have our uh, working meetings uh, on the first and third Thursday of every month. So we'll put that information and that's kind of a space like the webinars where we, you know, talk about sort of the issues or, or maybe sometimes have uh, folks come and speak. And then the working meetings is, is a space to go uh, a little deeper into exactly what you're talking about the work. Um, so definitely put that in the chat. And Hamid, I see your hand up. Before I go to you, I just see this uh, question in the chat. Have LAUSD affiliated groups or students organized against LASER as of yet? Um, so as far as we know, no, um, it's a very new app. Uh, so we, uh, yeah, so I mean, we're, we're, we're moving, we're organizing here and, and hopefully gonna continue growing that. Um, but if folks hear of or anything else, please, please do connect us, yeah. Um, all right, Hamid, go for it. Yeah, no, I think you you pretty much answered, and uh, Vanessa's comment was right on. So you know that sort of uh, uh, responded to what I was thinking too. But just on uh, from a teacher's vantage point, Nadia, you are an LAUSD high school teacher. 
uh, you know, and particularly in communities which are very directly targeted in South Central, how, uh, what sort of conversations is the teacher community have, having at, at LAUSD, if any, about these programs or, or specifically around LASER? Yeah, so um, at least at my school, LASER hasn't even been brought up uh, specifically. Um, and, at, and sort of in, in my school, I have not heard yet a court kind of language around extremism. Um, but I do know it, those conversations are happening in other schools. Um, I know, for example, uh, there has been backlash against teachers um, who, for example, talk about Palestine, right? And we can talk more about that. So um, I know that there is conversation happening and I know there's teachers in various sort of, um, you know, positions and feelings about this. Uh, yeah, I know if it does sort of get brought up at my school, I'm definitely going to very you know, um, yeah, now that I'm not an initial probationary teacher and they can't fire me for breathing wrong, I'll definitely be uh, be talking my shit about this app now if, if it gets brought up. So, and I hope other teachers do the same. And yeah, if anyone else, um, oh, thank you for the, thank you. That's, I appreciate that. Um, so yeah, I don't know if anyone else here maybe works in LUSD and has heard anything. Thank you, Jocelyn, I appreciate that. Um, okay, cool, cool. Uh, any other questions so far as of this? And we're gonna be continuing this conversation on the political landscape. Uh, we just wanna see if folks have any more questions about the program specifically. Uh, I, I did just wanna chime in and uh, respond to something Vanessa said about you know what the students' concerns are. And this is actually um, a topic we broached with our Fairfax High interns over spring break. Um, and they're very concerned. I mean, and this is just a group of five or six interns, but what they had brought up was even just fearing, um, understanding that this can be weaponized against students in some capacity, right? Like what if someone wants to retaliate against you for any, any number of reasons and, you know, they can report you through this app and you're subject to the criminalization that follows with that. Um, and then one of the things I, I think you brought up that, you know, I think we do need to uh, talk to our students about, and I'm curious what folks think, maybe this is something we can delve into as, as we explore this further is, you know, what's it like to have to learn and grow in an environment where you are under constant surveillance or risk of, you know, um, being uh, snitched on or whatever, put into a database. And so, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate you raising that and just thinking about how we can pose that question to our youth. Um, I wanted to quickly add that the other thing that the Fairfax High um, youth talked about in relation to the Lazar app was cyberbullying and the potential for this to be used by, you know, lots of kids mass reporting one kid um, as a form of bullying. So, yeah, they were they were all very clearly flagging. And then the last thing I wanted to say about this is also the one of the big ways that they're pushing this is through uh, the narrative that this app is necessary to fight fentanyl in schools and to fight drugs. Um, so just to watch out for that. I know that the high school that I live really close to had a really you know horrible incident where um, a kid died from an over overdose. And I, I've driven past it and seen that the front door has big plastered posters for see something, say something now. Um, which I think I haven't looked closely, but I think is for the app. Um, but yeah, just wanted to to share that. Yeah, thank thank you for sharing that, Akhil. Yeah, and I think what every what folks are sharing it just really shows, um, yeah, just how inherently problematic, right? This um this app is. So yeah. Definitely, um, and and I think as as we keep organizing and moving against this, um, yeah, I feel like a lot of people are going to be like, "What the hell?" Um, yeah. Um, cool. Well, I think I'll go ahead and pass it to you, Matios. I know um, you had um, some kind of discussion questions too, and and yeah, I just want to kind of keep continue to invite folks. I mean, it really sounds like um, you know this this group here, um, you know, has 
like I said, personal and or work experience kind of in fighting against youth criminalization. So um, yeah, definitely looking forward to see how we can keep building together. I'll pass it to you then, Matheus. Yeah, thanks, Nadia. This is Matthew speaking. Um, I, yeah, I think just some additional context. I know we've talked about it um, in kind of a great deal, but uh, you know, when Nadia was talking about this PATH program and its early iterations, and we talked a little bit about this last week during the gender and sexuality meeting, but earlier iterations of PATH were explicitly racist. It was, um, you know, it, it, it was pretty clear that they were targeting uh, black students, brown students, Muslim students in that way. Um, and now, you know, as the grant has been rebranded in different names, we, we're also seeing this kind of rebranding in what the program is targeting, right? Where there is this public health component, this pathologizing of dissent, and then, um, you know, what we at the coalition have talked about is like a, a medicalization of extremism, right? And we've even seen language of like identifying gender identity issues. Um, so we're seeing kind of this public health framework being used to target um, youth. And, you know, we've named some of the dangers that come with that or um, in this conversation. Um, but I also want to talk about, you know, kind of the mechanics of how these programs work as far as we know. And Akhil, I'd invite you to chime in uh, with any additions to this too. But we know that with the PATH program, what they plan on doing is training um, 500 uh, teachers, educators, LASD, um, you know, people who are meant to nurture youth and training them to look for these risk factors for extremism and to report these students, right? And then we're also, um, and, and that's a similar function to uh, this LASAR app, right? And when we think about who this program is meant to target, I think there are a couple of details from the program's proposal we can get to, to figure out, um, to tell us, like it's really indicative of like its true intent. One is um, the officer that they chose to uh, lead up the PATH program, I, I don't believe he's leading it any longer, is this officer named Alex Vargas, who was actually the LAPD um, head for the Fusion Center. And uh, Fusion Center, as we talk about, is a is a, a, it's kind of an information hub um, manned by multiple agencies. It's local, county, and federal agencies. All the information that's gathered is kind of stored here. Uh, the local fusion hub to Southern California is called JRIC, the Joint Regional Intelligence Center. It's in Norwalk. And this officer, you know, when they were discussing his role in leading this program for youth surveillance, one of the things they talked about was that he oversaw the George Floyd protests, you know, the monitoring of protesters that were primarily black and brown, right? Um, and so, you know, just thinking about that and thinking about also in this proposal, they cited the success of the suspicious activities report that I know Hamid uh, talked about last week, which was again, you know, um, part of that, I watch if you see something, say something, um, you know, a program that was, um, you know, through the coalition's work and organizing community members, we were able to identify that this program was, um, you know, racist, right? And so that was another program they cited um, and referenced in both rolling out PATH and, you know, subsequently this LASAR app came as a result of that. So just kind of in that ecosystem, and I think we also need to uplift and consider the work of groups like Students Deserve, right, who successfully got police presence outside of these schools, right? Um, and this really is an effort to kind of reaffirm that presence through the deputization of people that are meant to care for students or meant to cohabitate with students if they are their peers, you know, uh, and cultivate snitches in that way. So I guess just a couple questions for folks, one being, um, you know, what surprised you the most from what you've heard so far about how this program is being rolled out? And, um, if you have youth in your life, what are some what are some aspects you feel urgency around communicating? Uh, so I'll just open that up, and you can drop that in the chat, um, or raise your hand and unmute, and I'll type it out too. Please, Vanessa. Thank you. Yeah, um, one of the things that with all of this uh, that stands out to me is who's the data company? Like there's a lot of money that's being made like by big tech companies 
so like who's funding it like who are the who are the tech people who are getting these contracts right like i know in in a previous life when i worked for the county uh, department of mental health one of the reasons why i walked away i just could no longer do it was because i realized that there there's no they, they were making deals with developers to launch apps and fund all this stuff that wasn't real so then they ran out of things to come up with because people started fighting against everything including me and they were like okay everyone's gonna get like headspace this app it's gonna help everyone so la county had this massive rollout but if we wouldn't have advocated for stop what started happening is that these app developers were like contacting or like asking the state and getting like these like side deals with the state where they were like oh we're gonna do this we're gonna do that and little by little it started to be like we're in one of the counties la county actually launched an app called mindstrong that through someone's phone they can track how someone sounds and that could predict a mental health crisis so that was like extremely like gnarly, right? It was just like, what is happening? Well, one of the things that came out of those conversations is that data mining piece and how much money that's worth, right? Because big pharma wants to be able to then target those people. So this all sounds very conspiracy theory, but it's not, it's real, right? So it's like, our, how are we looking into the, who's getting those contracts? for these developers, you know, like tracking that part of it, because that's where a lot of the money comes to play. So I think, so that's something that, that comes up for me. And like, how are, you know, how does, I'm not one for the medical community, but you know what, but I do believe in, in some research. So, you know, what's the research that has been done to show the dangers or the efficacy of all this, right? So like, where's like where's the data? Like, show me the data, like, and because I think that's where it's like, how did it start? And it's usually stuff like this has to do with money, right? Yeah, no, I really appreciate that, uh, Vanessa. And I, I think a point of our research should be trying to figure out who created this app, who is, um, you know, who's kind of getting that funding in that way. And I want to honor, you know, the work of the coalition and the way we do talk a lot about um, this vast information sharing environment is that our bodies, our very existence is being datafied, right? For the purposes you stated, one is commodification, right? Like in, in that data mining, like how much money can they make off of us? The other is for control, like we're seeing be, being implemented um, through these apps. And this Mindstrong app you talked about for the county, I'd, I'd never heard of that. And that sounds incredibly creepy, um, especially considering how like, the Department of Mental Health does play a role in kind of the cultivation of even these youth policing programs. So, or at least, you know, we suspect that killer. I invite you to talk a little bit more about that. And just lastly, yeah, this relationship with big tech, um, we see that a lot with the LAPD, we know that tech companies or people from tech companies play a role in the Los Angeles Police Foundation, um, uh, you know, for the LAPD facilitating those donations um, and, you know, cement, a lot of those dona donations cement long-time deals, right? So we have like groups like Boston Dynamics, right? Who, who um, you know, are donating a robot dog or there's Axon and their body-worn video. And so, yeah, th this is something we've definitely seen in the past. I wonder if that's at play with Lazar. Um, but yeah, Akil, I'd, I'd like to invite you to speak on any of that or even the research component. Um, I know you've been studying Isomin and, and all that to see what they've kind of manufactured in order to support this stuff. Yeah, so, um, okay, that's a lot. Let me first, um, let me figure out where's the best place. I think first I would like to just show a couple slides, if that's okay, and then we'll come back to Eisenman. I, I wanted to make sure that people understood just what the material harm of these programs is. It's really, uh, it's really um, insidious because the way the program works oftentimes separates 
the actual spying, it, it's not necessarily clear how that person is later criminalized. But uh, one of the things that we can do is I, I, I can just show you, in fact, what the LAPD, how they're actually training for this PATH program. And it's really interesting. So um, part of how we do research in the coalition, one of the main ways we do research is through public records requests. So this is the portal for submitting records requests through um, for the city of LA. And we've submitted this request um, for, we, we found out LAPD actually posted themselves on Twitter that they were having a PATH training day. And they posted on Instagram and Facebook, all their platforms at this training day had members of LAUSD present. Uh, so we submitted a records request asking for information about that training day, who was present and what were they, how were they training? What was the presentation they were using, et cetera. Um, we still don't know the names of the LAUSD people present, but we had the names of all the cops that were present, which is interesting. And if you actually look at, um, their training, it's co-hosted by the LA County Department of Mental Health. This is when the training day was. It was September 24th last year. So this program is being done in complete partnership with the Department of Mental Health. And if we're going to be specific, a lot of the specific mental de Department of Mental Health employees that are collaborating on, on this program have been part of the school threat assessment and response team, which is the the team that works with not only LAUSD, but I, I think community colleges in the LA area as well as the main liaison to with the police to, to target a youth they think is a threat uh, and to do threat assessments on them, et cetera. So some of, the, some of the Department of Mental Health employees that are working on this have been involved in that team too. Um, and so this is the front slide. You can see that it's a, a combination of the, the county. Um, this is counterterrorism. I can't necessarily recognize all these different logos, but um, if anybody knows those. Um, and we start off right away with the blue lion flag. Um, and uh, one thing that becomes clear as we look at these training slides, so here's their slide around the pathway to violence, grievance, violent ideation, research planning, preparation, probing and breaching, and then attack. So this is the narrative they're constructing. And these are the eight warning behaviors. This is at least as of recently as of, um, uh, of uh, last September. And remember that it used to be much more overt that they were going after specifically, you know, specific communities. They named things such as being passionate about Somalia as an example of a risk factor, or having criticism of US foreign policy, you're thinking that uh, Israel is to blame for problems in the Middle East as a risk factor in extremism. And also things such as growing a beard or going to, to or having absolute faith in the mosque, that was a quote they used. Um, so definitely very explicitly Islamophobic, targeting black Muslims, targeting Muslim refugees, um, now the narrative has shifted and they claim to be targeting school shooters. So you see these slides and they claim that PATH, they, they're pretending that PATH is a tool to fight white supremacy. As if the LAPD could be trusted to fight white. It's like, um, I can't, my mind is struggling for a metaphor because that's already absurd enough. Um, so, uh, so this is what they're trying. There's, they're claiming that they're not doing profiling. They're doing what they call behavioral surveillance. So they're using behaviors which they claim are neutral, but we all know that behaviors are actually a proxy for race in this situation, or religion, or other characteristics that they're profiling for. So uh, they, they, they again name, see something, say something. The anonymous reporting app. The anonymous. I watch, et cetera, which, you know, again, to remind everybody, uh, audits show that uh, these suspicious activity reports that were being done under the framework of see something, say something, were vastly disproportionately targeting Black people, basically a legitimization of racial profiling. So again, claiming that this is based on school shooters. Um, now, this is the, how the narrative has shifted. I want to show you all really quickly 
the way that they describe the structure of this program through a graphic. Here we go. So this is the structure of this program from themselves. They say they, they have a person of concern, a person they're targeting. This spark is a nice way of saying that they're profiled by somebody in the community. Again, this is, could be one of their 500 person team of uh, teachers, social workers, counselors, faith leaders. That person reports them reporting on various channels or a 911 call. And then this is the three different places they see that going. Supposedly, there's going to be resources to divert them from this pathway to violence, hospitalization in a psychiatric facility, or crime and arrest, and then conviction. So they name it here, but the, the actual technical way this works is that when uh, somebody in this threat assessment, sorry, when somebody in this path informant team reports up on a person to LAPD's threat assessment team, that report gets stored in a building called a fusion center. So Matteo's named fusion center earlier because the person that they appointed to lead path was the head of the fusion center. Fusion centers are basically these federal spy agency spy hubs all around the country. They're run by the Department of Homeland Security. So they're actually federal buildings. So they're subject to the FOIA. They're run by the federal government, not the local government. And th these spy agency buildings collect and exchange information like hubs of a wheel from all the different uh, police departments and even other sources like the DMV, et cetera, in, in the area. So the Stop LAPD spying has actually shut down our local fusion center twice. Um, this fusion center, which you know Alex Vargas headed, will store this will store this profile on the secret profile on some on a youth coming from this 500 person informant team and from then on police can actually access that file when they pull the youth over they can actually put access that file and then choose to pull that youth over for something else um so basically that um or pu pull over as if they're but you know, stop them on the street, follow them, you know, target them in all these different ways. It, it basically enters them into the system for nothing other than a quote unquote spark from a, a community member. And not only are they, you know, starting off with teachers, social workers, and counselors, but we have to see how LASAR fits into this too. They're trying to expand who can be creating these persons of concern to other youth as well. Um, and all of this is because our organizing against the suspicious activity reporting program, the light that's been shined on it, shown on it, I don't know, um, the way that it's been revealed to be this, this extremely racist program. I don't really know exactly all the reasons, but, but uh, suspicious acti activity reports are way down. And you could see these programs, LASAR, path as basically trying to jumpstart these programs, trying to give them steroids and trying to criminalize a whole new genera generation of youth through their own involvement and through trusted channels, you know, weaponizing places that they go to for support. Yeah, sorry, that's, that was a lot, but I just wanted to outline how, how exactly this program works and also the fact that they're trying to cloak it in these these uh, these veils that it's going to be targeting school shooters and drugs and white supremacy, as if it's not going to be weaponized against the same youth that the LAPD is always targeted. This is Matthew speaking. Uh, yeah, I want to go over some of the responses in the chat, but before I do, do folks have any questions or comments about what Akhil just shared? Ms. Angela, I, I'm wondering, uh, do we know any of the so-called community resources that they are um, listing? I don't, does anybody else? That's a good question for a PRA, for a records request. Yeah, because sometimes there aren't any, <laughs> but other times they, you know, it, it would be interesting to see if they 
we're simply referring to Department of Mental Health or, or others um, along that vein. That's a great yeah, point. Yeah, and I was gonna say thank you, Angela. I think that's that's a great uh, PRA um, question. I do agree. Um, and yeah, and and you know, for, for folks who are familiar, PRA is basically a public records act request, right? So that's um, uh, there's a national program called the Freedom of Information Act, which essentially says that you know we that people have the right to public information about, about public agencies, public institutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so PRA is California's version of that, Public Records Act. And so, um, you know, one thing with the coalition, we, we like to, you know, and we've done the PRA workshops really see what is it that folks want to know about programs. So, so yeah, so thank you for, for asking that, Angela. And, and, and I think, um, you know, what I was going to also say is, um, you know, Akhil, I appreciate you highlighting just the, the community power as well, right? Because I think um, when, when, when we look at these programs, I think it's important to remind ourselves, right, of, of the power we have as community, of being able to shut down the fusion center twice, right? Um, of being able to get rid of predictive policing out of LA, uh, right? Being able to ground the LAPD drones for years, um, et cetera, et cetera. And, and like you just said, uh, I do think that you know, the suspicious activity reports being down. And I'm sure it's because uh, folks have, have shown, I guess, shown a light on it. Uh, so, so yeah, so I just wanted to appreciate and, you. And I just wanted to add, like, you know, as a, a person that has needed mental health um, resources for family members, there's so few of them. So that's why I think it's really critical to highlight the so-called community resources are often not that and, and whoever they list are not capable of actually responding in the way we might imagine. So I think a lot of these um, grants are written, you know, with the vague term community resources um, and that gives them cover, but they don't, actually, they don't actually exist. The community organizations themselves don't have a rapid response um, program or, you know, there, there are just details about those programs that we need to shine a light on because it's it's clearly just smoke and mirrors. Absolutely. They, they don't want to admit they're just going to put them in jail and send them to the hospital. That's right. No, we definitely need to delegitimize them um, and kind of shine a light on those false claims. I appreciate that. At the same time, we really do need those kind of services. So. <laughs> <laughs> if they did exist, I'd be happy to know about it, but I don't know about uh, very many of them, including the Department of Mental Health. You would, you would hope that they were able to do things like that, but they're not. Yeah, and you know, Angela, I'm so glad you said that because you know when we talk about community alternatives um, to policing, I think that is another facet we need to we need to like talk about more frequently, right? There are services that we need. And a lot of the times those sort of services don't exist because of uh, yeah. policing in this way. Exactly. Yeah, that's a great PRA question. I just wanna to welcome Thomas into the space. Uh, Th Thomas, we did do a round of introductions if you wanna say your name, pronoun, and what brought you into the space, but you can also just type it into the chat if you don't feel like unmuting. All right, and just really quickly, I wanna read out some of the responses to the question um, we asked earlier about what surprised folks the most um, from what you've heard so far and what do you feel urgency around communicating? We got Eugene, urgency around communicating uh, to the youth that the longer we wait to defund and abolish the police, the harder it will be in the future to build and create a better and sustainable world. And for sure, the, these are, you know, these are sophistications that come about from not abolishing police, right? Uh, these are reforms or fixes that um, just perpetuate the same violence and in a lot of ways uh, worsen it. So absolutely, Eugene, thank you for that. Do folks have any thoughts or questions about that or responses?
and then next up we have from Jocelyn. And Jocelyn, I'm, I'm happy to read through some of this, but you're also welcome to unmute and talk about it. I thought this was a really powerful comment. Um, yeah, I want to invite you to unmute to talk about it a little bit more, but if you're not in a position where you can do that, that's not a problem too. All right, well, I'm going to skim through it because it is great. And, you know, it's, you know, being surprised by this program's emphasis on identifying anger, dissent, uh, and extremism. And, you know, our youth have so much to be angry at and dissent against. Yeah, these programs are attempting to strip them from their voices by pitting students against each other and are putting more power in the hands of teachers and social workers that are already racially profiling students. And also, as I type this, another thing was shocking to learn is how PATH training programs was in collaboration with LA County Department of Mental Health. Yeah, it's gaslighting in a lot of ways, right? Like these students are a problem for dissenting against things that should be dissented against. Um, and I think we at the coalition would say, you know, that is their function, right, is to target dissent, to, to squash resistance. Um, but yeah, thank you for that that comment, Jocelyn. Oh, no worries. I'm just seeing your comment down below. And then let's see. Yeah, Mamta, I, I don't know if it's illegal. Uh, I haven't heard about any lawsuits about this yet, but we know <laughs> whether it's illegal or not, they're going to do it. <laughs> so, yep. And then a question from Sydney. Can we flood this SAR platform? I, you know, that's a question for the tech folks. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much for your responses, everyone. So, yeah, folks, come in for our Thursday um, working meeting. We're, we'll kind of cultivate a few more of these questions. We can delve into some research we already have underway and uh, maybe even craft some more public comments. Um, and that is gonna be, Akil, I think that's this Thursday, right? Is our third? That's the third Thursday of the month. I need to check the calendar to- No, it's uh, the 20th is our next, our next one. So next week, and you could just email us at stoplapdspying at gmail.com. I also just wanted to say that we have records requests out to both the LAUSD, the Los Angeles School District, and to the Department of Mental Health, trying to figure out just exactly who has been attending these trainings. So that's something that's really interesting. Although we already know from their schedule, these are two of the Department of Mental Health trainers. And I, again, I think both of them have been involved in the school threat assessment and response team. Um, and we also have the list of the full list of all the cops that attended, at least this one training. But then there's another oops, there's another one later on. So we, we're we're getting some stuff. So if you're all, at all interested in doing research, um, please join. We uh, when we do research meetings, they're really fun and relaxing. We just look through documents while listening to music. So. Yeah, please email stop LAPD spying at gmail.com if you want to get involved. Thank you for that, Akil. Oh, there's a comment in the chat from Mamta. Yeah, you want to go for it? Me? Me? Yeah, yeah or I can kick it off, whatever. <laughs> whatever. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I think we're all still trying to figure it out, but number one is organizing the youth because um yeah organizing youth organizing teachers and organizing social workers and we want to do all of that so we're doing these youth days in the park partly because we want to you know spread the message of abolition in general and create a place for youth um you know just in general but also because we want to and parents yes thank you chala yes um um so um yeah we just need to organize and we need to expose and we need to um i don't know 
I don't have a better answer, but Matios, you want to go for it? No, that was my answer. You stole my answer. Yeah, we're organizing youth, uh, cultivating this, this culture of resistance that's already there, you know, uh, just trying to help nurture that. Um, yeah. Nadia, you got a better answer? If you, if you want to chime in there. No, this one sounds good. Cool. Um, so yeah, plug in that way, come through on Saturday. And with that, that's kind of a neat little segue to talk about our, um, if folks are good with that, we can move on over to our upcoming Youth Day in the Park. And if you have any other questions about, um, any of the information covered so far, shoot us an email or DM us on Instagram or Twitter at Stop LAPD Spine. Um, we'll be happy to get back to you. But yeah, kind of in response to these programs and in response to the fact that, you know, police have so much access to our students, right, through uh, community programs, or which are community policing counterinsurgency programs, or um, through like police magnets in some school some schools, um, you know, we, we understand that they have many ways to access and surveil our youth, right, and perpetuate uh, the normalization of that access and surveillance. And so it's for that reason that, you know, we've cultivated abolitionist curriculum and worked with groups like STEM to the Future um, to, to introduce that to youth, right, to introduce our analysis and also to learn from youth to see how they think about policing and how in the ways they're impacted. Um, another thing we do is the internship we talked about earlier, but um, we constantly try to cultivate spaces uh, where we can uh, nurture that culture of resistance and create environments kind of free of policing and are welcome to discourse and conversation and creation that centers abolition. Um, so it's in that spirit and with that intent that uh, we're having our second monthly youth day at the park so much of our programming and work is centered on different age groups right so you know again working with those first through fourth graders and um you know we have separate curriculum for high schoolers but or um you know content for high schoolers and so this is a space where we kind of all come together and it's unstructured it's fun it's a saturday morning in, in a nice scenic park we're making art we're making t-shirts uh we're talking about whatever they're Last month, there were babies there, which was incredible. Um, so uh, we want to invite folks, one, to show up to this space and just have fun with us um, and talk about this stuff. We're going to be at Vista Hermosa Park. Uh, but we also wanted to open it up to folks to talk about, you know, what what do you want to see in a space like this? Like, what does a space that um, facilitates um, thinking about an abolitionist future look like to you? Um, you know, and so. Um, yeah, just want to open that up for folks. I also want to invite Akhil or Nadia to talk about um, maybe some aspects of the space that I haven't brought up um, or aspects of the intention of the space that I haven't brought up. Um, yeah, I know. Thank you for, for bringing that up. And, and um, yeah, I think the, the one thing I'll add is, um, you know, this is something kind of um, like right before COVID, we had started sort of thinking about with, uh, along with the PYM Palestinian Youth Movement, who uh, who moves this, who has been moving this war, um, co-leading this war and youth fight with us. And really, we just, we had collectively thought about, okay, we want a space for, to just for youth to physically gather and come together, right, to, um, to be able to like, to learn about these issues, express their issues, and, and build power together. And um, and be able to connect, right, surveillance also to to the various components and those things they might be um, dealing with and, and fighting against. And so, um, so that was kind of some of the thought behind that. And um, you know, and then obviously COVID happened, so the, the physical gathering, you know, that put on a pause. And I think now that we're coming together again, uh, I know like pr prior to the first art day, we had talked about um, you know doing some programming, but then we got to the art day. And it just kind of made more sense to sort of, we have like different stations and different activities going on. And so I think now we're thinking, okay, we, we want to sort of keep that, like 
that free flow and that sort of different art making happening and also bring in uh, which art making we know in itself is uh, is building power is fighting the state so just inherently that is right um but also bringing in the element of you know just building power against surveillance and decriminalization so um so yeah so just inviting folks to um you know share ideas and and um you know we we have a few kind of activities in mind like like much as the t-shirt making uh, one of our comrades at Steam to the Future had shared this really cool, um, uh, what's it called, scavenger hunt type thing. I know last time, this sort of impromptu little mini nature walk happened with Akil and a couple of the kids. Um, so yeah, so uh, I would say that would be all I'll add right now. Um, but yeah, any, any uh, Akil, you want to add anything? Or if anyone else has, or if anyone has any ideas or things like much as they would like to see. I can't think of something to add right now, but yeah, I'm down to to write down people's ideas. I can I can uh, open up our doc, but yeah, go ahead. Just one thing I want to add about this space. Uh, you know, when I talked about the work that we did with STEM to the Future, a lot of that was like curriculum development and just teaching the kids, uh, so to speak, but a lot of it was also uh, creating and developing what are effectively games, right? To, to um, uh, kind of explain our analysis on surveillance. One of those games was a budget making exercise where uh, we talked about, you know, the federal budget and the different facets of the federal budget, and then allowed the students to divvy out, um, you know, resources on the budget um, collectively, right? So we gave them 100 poker chips, and that was 1% of the budget, and then cut it up uh, into the segments in the way the federal government does, and they would allocate five chips here, 10 chips here, um, and make a case for why education should get more than the environment, or maybe um, uh, education should get more than, um, what was that, public health, right? Uh, and so um, that was a fun little exercise. People debated, people argued, um, and then people were surprised by the fact that the military got 50% of our federal budget uh, and, you know, other facets got so little. And, um, yeah, they, they had a lot of fun with it. They even exhibited it at um, uh, UCLA Law um, at a little program they had there. So that was really exciting. Another game that they kind of played was a game where uh, they um, talked about why there may not be trees in certain neighborhoods, right? And so they even learned about crime prevention through environmental design and the, the ramifications that has in our communities, like uh, you know, higher temperatures, a lack of a meeting center, or community hub for spaces. And so it was really cool to see a nine-year-old write out SEPTED crime prevention through environmental design on a whiteboard. But what came with that was a game where they kind of hid behind trees and um, a little play mayor or sheriff. That was usually me. Was usually the bad guy. Um, I was looking for crime, um, uh, you know, in these settings, and so um, that is an aspect we want to introduce into this space, right? So when we think about fun and games, it is still educational, and um, uh, you know, still explains kind of uh, um, the things we're always trying to communicate and in our popular education. And so, um, if folks have any ideas about that, or maybe even things you feel like you wanna see covered in that way. Uh, it could be stuff we talked about today. It could be stuff from outside today. I'd love for folks to chime in. We got imperialism in the chat. Yes. And Mamta, if you have any ideas of what that could look like, you don't necessarily have to, please um, uh, unmute and share or you can drop it in the chat. Um, yeah, no, thank you. I I don't have an exercise in mind, but I just, I just think it's really cool what you shared and the exercises you did and just sort of like really distilling it to its, um, 
in a way that people like kids can relate to it. And, um, and yeah, I, I just think it's such an important thing to convey, but conveying it in a way that, um, that makes it really tangible. So I, I feel like imperialism, like is so defines so much of, right, like our reality and, um, and I think it would be cool to develop an exercise around it. So I will think about it for sure. It's also totally, Mamta, it's also like kind of a logical next step in talking about the federal budget, right? Why does the military get 50% of our federal budget? And so that is a nice little segue into talking about imperialism. Yeah, totally. And like, you know, how that actually, right. So like how that affects um, like our day-to-day -day life that like, you know, people don't have health care, people don't have you know, decent access to education. And yet there's, you know, $110 billion going to Ukraine um, to fight a proxy war. And like, just like the criminality of that, I think like is part of, um, I don't know. I just think like that's, that's an important sort of aspect of, um, Yeah, I don't know. Like, yeah, I just think that's that that's an important aspect of why, you know, people don't have the things that we don't have the things that we need in our right, like daily lives also. Yes, absolutely. Thank you for that, Mamta. Akil, I see you're unmuted. Oh, I didn't mean to be. Sorry. Actually, I was just thinking maybe if there's a way we can turn certain board games into some like something to do with imperialism whether that's like risk or, or monopoly or something but that doesn't necessarily work that well for a park but it was just brainstorming you know i'd love to see um us introduce the idea of gentrification displacement and banishment in the game uh, like folks getting you know, pushed out of communities and the different factors that play into that, maybe how the police play into that. And um, yeah. So I'd, I don't have any ideas right now, but that's just something I'd like to see happen next. Okay, and this is definitely something we can also broach uh, during our working meeting uh, on the 20th. Um, loving these ideas from Thomas in the chat. I, and is that in relation oh my gosh. to gentrification? Um, uh, the gentrification topic? Yeah, yeah, that's perfect. Yeah, what if, uh, oh my gosh, I love that. What if the kids... And we were doing musical chairs and then Matios, who's always the bad guy, just every time like a kid gets out and there's one fewer chair, Matios gets an extra chair and he just starts lying down on all of his chairs and just making a show of how, how many chairs he has while the others are scrambling for, for whatever chairs are left. Yeah, I like that idea. That's great.
Uh, I'd like to propose some edits to Eugene's suggestion. <laughs> but I, I appreciate the messaging. Yeah, eat the rich. <laughs> All right, well, again, this is something we can uh, broach at the working meeting, but we really, really hope y'all can be there on Saturday and uh, we hope you can bring uh, some of the youth in your life um, and just come have fun. I'll kill Nadia, anything you wanna add to that? No, yeah, we hope to see folks there. And um, yeah, and, and like I said, for, you know, um, who just want to build a little deeper, yeah, come to our working meeting and we'll keep strategizing there. Thank you. Awesome. All right. Any announcements, Hamid, or any, any community announcements? Next week is our general. Um, sorry, my camera is just staying frozen, so. Um... No, just uh, we already talked about uh, the uh, uh, Saturday. And then uh, next Tuesday our, is our general meeting, which will be in person. It won't be over Zoom. It'll be in person at LA Can. So keep an eye out for that, folks, 6 o'clock. It'll be a general meeting talking about political landscape and, and strategizing and how do we continue to build our work. Thank you. Yes, thank you, Hamid. And we are in court this Thursday if folks want to show up and support, I will drop the Instagram post uh, with the details. Um, and this is our, um, you know, slap case against the city for trying to suppress our website, Watch the Watchers. Um, and so I'll drop that in. It's actually our anti-slap. Anti-slap, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Which is SLAPP, which is a strategic lawsuit against political participation. If folks don't know that's uh, the city has been has sued us and they tried to get a restraining order against the watch the watchers website first and they lost and then they filed for a writ of possession just to, to take it back and they lost on that too so so we filed for dismissal but we are also saying that the website itself is free speech because it basically represents what almost 4.3 million residents of the city of Los Angeles would like to have, which is have the pictures of all LAPD officers on a website so they know who the, who, what kind of work, what, what, what kind of violence they're engaging in, who these fools are. So, so yeah, thank you. Keeping fingers crossed. All right. Well, thanks so much, folks, for plugging in. Hope we see you. Thursday morning, Saturday morning, and then next week, Tuesday evening at LA Can. <laughs> all right. Everyone have a great rest of your night. Thanks, y'all. Thank you. All. Thank you all. All right.